Welcome to this virtual conversation, co-hosted by the Washington State Wire and City Year Seattle and King County. Going back to school, COVID and equity in education. Moderating the event is DJ Wilson, publisher of the Washington State Wire. To start us off, here is Lee Lambert, the executive director of City Year Seattle and King County. Hello, my name is Lee Lambert and I'm the executive director of City Year Seattle. Thank you for coming to this town hall we're doing in partnership with the Washington State Wire. For those of you who don't know, City Year is a national service organization and City Year has been in Seattle working in the schools for over 20, for 22 years. What we do is we place AmeriCorps in schools in Southeast and Southwest Seattle to support students' academic and social emotional development. This school year, we'll be placing 86 core members in 10 South Seattle schools. Now during a traditional city year, uh, core members arrive at school at 7 a.m. and are there till five in the evening, five days a week. This year is gonna be a little different. Thank you for coming to our town hall and I will now pass it over to my friend and colleague, DJ Wilson, to introduce the members of our town hall. Uh, uh, look forward to a lively discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lee. I appreciate your leadership on this and the partnership of City Year as we've worked to bring this panel together. As Lee said, my name is DJ Wilson, one of the hosts of our uh, virtual conversation here this afternoon. And if you're a parent or you're a grandparent or you're and you know kids next door, uh, if you're a member of our community, you're thinking about or aware of the challenges related to going back to school this fall. It's always an anxious and exciting time for kids and families as September rolls around, but this year is particularly challenging. And given the stress from both our econo economic, uh, uh, gosh, our recession and the plight that we're in, as well as our public health challenges, this, this year will provide even, even greater strains and, and even greater tests for issues like equality or rather equity in particular in uh, the schools, making sure that folks who are, uh, who are attending our public schools across the widest range of economy or rather economics and demographics and geographic uh, diversity can have equal access to a good, strong public and quality education. So before I jump into our uh, introduction of our panelists today, I wanna orient you a little bit to some of what we have on our screen. We have about 200 folks registered to join us. There's usually about 70% of folks who end up making it uh, to be with us. Next to the screen here on the right, you've got a chat box, which uh, has a public chat function. Certainly you can, under the Q&A portion of that chat box, you can type in your comments, your questions. You can also upvote those things that you think are most compelling and most interesting from others on the, on the show today. Those won't be visible to folks who watch this afterwards, but for those of us in the conversation here, you can upvote those and I'll take those comments and those questions and try to integrate them into our conversation today. We wanna to try to create as interactive of an experience as possible for you. And we really appreciate you making time to be with us today. As I implied, this will be on our website at thewashingtonstatewire.com. And we're also uh, hosting this at TVW, one of our partners in the production of this series. So without further ado, I wanna introduce our panelists today. First is Denise Juno, the superintendent for Seattle Public Schools. We also have Sophia Vos, the National Director of Staff Learning and Practice at City Year. And uh, finally, Leslie Hernandez, AmeriCorps member and team leader at Concord International Elementary School. Thank you, each of you, for making time to be with us. I'm looking forward to hearing from each of y'all. Uh, but first, let me ask you, uh, Denise, tell us about just some of uh, what Seattle schools have on tap according to your plan. I know the school board still gets an opportunity to uh, to weigh in and we'll have a say on this, but your vision for Seattle Public Schools here in September looks like what, where we sit today at the end of July? Yeah, I mean, we were really hopeful that we'd be able to be back in person at least a little bit. And, um, you know, we have plans that we've been making for hybrid models. We were trying to, our initial plans with given with the social distancing and all the requirements that we were having to do around um, the public health advice was really going to allow us to bring students back two times a week at least and then maybe in the earlier grades k2 maybe four times a week but now with just the spike in the in what the infection rate that keeps trending upward um, it really became clear that we would have to start the year in a remote setting and so we were also creating plans for that you know i think as we closed last March um, and made that pivot into an emergency sort of education setting, 
we really wanted to make sure that we were taking care of our communities, um, taking care of our students and their families. And so really switched to basic need mode. Um, we ser we've served over a million meals across the city. Um, and then of course our educators did a huge lift of doing business differently and having to engage in an online setting. We've learned a lot of lessons through that closure and that emergency uh, education setting that you know we know that we have to have clear systems set up going into September. So common platforms, common ways of communicating with families and students. Um, every student in our district now has an email address. So the communication can be a little more direct um, between teacher and student. Um, we are going to have more live on more live teaching. Um, you know, there was a lot of videos that we created. Our, we had over, I don't know, a lot of videos that we put up on SPS TV. We had a lot of hard copy learning packets. We're switching to a more consistent schedule, um, online schedule with more live, live teaching and learning going on. And so there will be better system set up um, that is the plan and that's the plan that we will present to the school board in a week. Um, we Absolutely. know that there were some struggles with connectivity and with devices. We uh, uh, have our devices on order and we hope to partner with great groups like City Year to help make sure that we are getting a device to every student in our district. Um, and then of course, making sure that they are connected so that they can receive that live instruction and, and the other things that the teachers will be putting out. And so that's sort of our plan is to build better systems, to have better systems, more consistency, no more predictability around schedules and uh, a, a better experience, I guess, going forward in a remote setting than we've been able to do in the past. Give us a sense, Denise, of what this time is like as a public education leader within the context of your career as a person. I mean, we're all kind of going through this collective trauma on the public health and the, and the economic health of our communities together. But as an individual, how do you sort of put this context, or put this experience within the context of your overall career? Well, it is super strange. I mean, I think people are feeling that across the board, you know, when we are used to greeting people and doing handshakes and just having building relationship in person and having this remote setting and social distancing and all these new words that we're used to now. And even just our greetings that we usually provide each other about, well, how are you doing? You know, it's like, well, we all know how each other is doing right now. It's like not a great place for any of us to be in. And so I think there's just a really big need for self care and trying to build in um, balance um, of making sure that we are still engaging in physical activity, you know, that it's summer in Seattle right now and that we are getting outside and doing all the things that we want to do. But it is, I think, across the board, and we can ask anybody that it is a really strange experience right now in this country and across the globe of how are we doing business? How are we taking care of ourselves? How are we making sure that we're checking in on our loved ones? Um, and I think that again, goes to sort of the bigger issue as well as like, as we enter into this remote setting in our public schools, how are those relationships going to be created? How are we going to make sure that our educators and the adults in our system know every, st every student's story, strength and need? Um, and so that's going to be a huge lift because we can't be in person of how do we make sure that we're doing those social emotional check-ins? How are we making sure that we're engaging families how are we progress monitoring? Um, and so individually, I think we're all feeling stress and strain and isolation and anxiety. And then you add that to a family setting as well, who is struggling with trying to make ends meet, having to be essential worker and going to having to go to work. What do you do with your students? Adding that then to a school building of teachers who want to really be engaged with their students and, and having to learn a new system and a new way of doing that and then adding it to a city that is also going through this collective um, way, new, new way of navigating. I, it's, it's a lot and it's a lot for everybody. And then if you think that you are a student or a young person in a system, 
that we have to really rethink and reimagine and recreate um, that will be better for our students of color coming to school. You know, I'm really paying attention. We have a strong strategic plan that requires us to make sure that we are building systems and changing the structures of our system to better meet their needs. Um, that it's, it's a lot, um, but it's all doable. And it is with partners. It's with the city of Seattle. I often say Seattle is built, they're rich in income. They are rich in personality. They are rich in intelligence. And if things can happen in a good way anywhere, it can happen here in Seattle. Yeah, good stuff. Sophia, let me ask you about this question of uh, that, that Denise sort of elevates about making sure the school district takes care of people who are black and brown and, and other ethnic minorities uh, that may come from communities that are economically disadvantaged compared to other communities in our uh, other neighborhoods in our city of Seattle. How has how have you found with a, your national perspective the, the Seattle Public Schools to be meeting the needs and trying to address this challenge of equity? Um, how does the Seattle Public School System compare to other school systems in the country? What what are we doing well here? What are we doing less well? Yeah, first of all, I want to say I don't envy the superintendent her job right now. So appreciate you, Denise, and all the work that you're doing on behalf of students and families. Um, and I had the pleasure of, you know, prior to my current role working for City Year Headquarters, I worked at City Year Seattle and got to partner with the superintendent pretty closely on a couple different things through City Year. Um, and, you know, it's it's no, uh, it's not hidden here in Seattle that we have a large gap when it comes to how our black and brown students are doing compared to our white students, at least compared to when we're looking at really traditional markers of what that looks like. And I would say that's true across the country as well, right? Um, and we, you know, I hear a lot in today's kind of world and, and uh, ecosystem that we're operating without a playbook here. I think that's very true. And I think that when we pause, we consider that, you know, a lot of our black and brown families have been operating without a playbook that works for them for a really long time, right? So like, it does present an opportunity to rethink what is that playbook and how do we rewrite that so that it is centering and supporting those students and families. Um, in terms of your question of Seattle versus, you know, other places in the country, I do consider us to be lucky in the ways in which our district partners to center students and to center equity. You know, when I think about City or Seattle, for example, um, we put out a statement a few years ago around wanting to work towards becoming a more anti-racist organization. And the only reason, I think one of the only reasons we were able to do that is we were in an environment, in a system that was aligned with us in a lot of ways around um, striving for that goal, right? So for example, in Seattle Public Schools, there are racial equity teams at almost all of our, our public schools. And I think, you know, going from this local to national perspective, one thing that surprised me is how unique that type of model is. I think we take it for granted sometimes, but talking to my peers from around the country who are obviously in many different political spheres. We're in 29 cities across the country and the most, you know, the major metropolitan areas. So there's different political contexts to consider. There's different demographics, demographic contexts to consider. Um, and when I look at all of that, you know, I think we were able to make that statement three years ago because of the work that Seattle Public Schools is open to doing and the centering and the acknowledgement that there's a problem. And I think that that is a lot of what we've, um, that I appreciate that has happened, that there's, we're looking at the data, we're um, being really honest with ourselves about the ways in which our, our students are given opportunities to succeed in the ways they're not, um, in a way that I appreciate um, in partnership here. Um, and it's something that you don't necessarily find with every school district or every superintendent that you work with across different realms. So I think that's one thing. You know, I think on the other hand, right, like we still have a ton of work to do. So, you know, as Superintendent Juno laid out, we're a city that is overwhelmingly wealthy, right? Like in terms of the resources that are available to us, in terms of the, um, the sort of sectors that are present in our system, there is no reason that uh, there should be a big, as big of a gap as there is um, between our, our students and the resourcing of our students. And you can, you can very much see the difference along racial lines, right? Um, which then believe, leads me to think more about how is the system that we've created perpetuating these inequities, right? And what are the ways in which we are also thinking about um, solutions at a systemic level and as well as in things like 
on the ground at school with racial justice teams and other ways, there's many, many ways we have to tackle this. Yeah, it's a, a multifaceted challenge. Leslie, let me turn to you. You're an AmeriCorps volunteer. You're in the schools, particularly, obviously, Concord International Elementary School with little kiddos. And I'm sure you want to wrap your arms around all of them just as any human would want to and give them all and love them up. Um, what are kids, what were they, how are they sort of experiencing this distance learning um, model in the spring? What are you anticipating for the fall? What what has your experience been working with these kids and and um, trying to address systemic issues of equity and opportunity? Um, yeah, uh, first of all, I wanna name that I can only speak to my own experiences. I don't wanna speak for my students. Um, but at the end of last year, um, since it was a sudden change and we weren't really prepared for what was coming, there was a lot of ambiguity. Um, but once we got once we got into planning and really thinking, um, our virtual service uh, it looked um, it looked different depending on the school and the classroom and the, the teachers that we were working with. Um, but I. I worked with two partner teachers and uh, uh, the way I supported in the classroom was with small groups and in a whole class um, group. Um, so I would meet with students twice a week and we would meet for half an hour and we would talk about, or we would work on um, learning targets that the partner teachers would assign. And once a week we would come together as a whole group. Um, sometimes not all students would be present, but it was it was nice on most days um, to see most students be able to make it out. Um, and like I mentioned, um, virtual service looked different depending on the school. Um, one thing that we did as a Concord school team, we created a YouTube channel to be able to still be able to engage and connect with students, although we weren't able to receive that instant um, reaction because we were on a virtual platform, um, but we were still hopeful that we were still able to reach students um, through uh, our YouTube channel. Um, that's good stuff. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's a perfect example of uh, using technology that meets the needs of the generation rather than meets the needs of the administration, so to speak, uh, using social media like YouTube. Uh, let me ask Denise you this question. This comes from a couple people already on our uh, chat. One is uh, uh, Edry Geiger, and another is former state representative Ruth Kage, who's one of really the, uh, the lionesses of education and young, young people, youth policy in Washington state over the last 20 plus years. Uh, they're asking about how we support teachers through training for online services and how how we're giving them the tools that they need to be successful in this new dynamic. Yeah, and so we'll be also taking a few days at the beginning of the school year um, to when, as teachers come back into, uh, into work that we are going to be training on those common platforms um, and making sure that they get the professional development that they need in order to deliver their quality instruction through this medium, right? And it's, it's so different. I mean, people go through their teacher education programs. This is not what those are designed to, to, to do, right? Is it online sort of virtual learning. And so we'll be taking a few days and really trying to um, in, tr train teachers on our common platforms and um, how to do synchronous or live learning, how to do all of those things. And so, um, so, so hopefully at the beginning of the school year, we'll be able to uh, work with our teachers and our educators and really figure out how this is going to get done. But that's all in the works. How do we, you know, so I, uh, Lee knows this about me. There was a time when I was teaching at the community college level and I taught in person and I also taught online. And one of the things I learned from that experience and, and learned from other teachers at the community college level back in those days was that some people are good at teaching in person and they enjoy it. Some people are good at teaching online and they enjoy it. There are not a lot of people who are good at doing both and enjoy doing both. How do you sort of support teachers who might be amazing in the classroom, but for any number of reasons, not as adept 
in the online place. And even after a lot of support and training like that, which you've identified, maybe they just don't have as much of a love for the online space as they might for the in-class experience. Those are all great questions and then we're going to have to really lean in. And I mean, this is hopefully not going to last forever that we are always working towards getting back to in-person. Um, and again, all of us have to do our part, right? We have to wear the masks, we have to social distance. It's the only way that we're ever going to be able to get together in person again. But the goal is always to get back. And so again, I think that we are thrown into this space that's really strange um, and people are going to have to rise to the challenge uh, of being able to engage students to, um, to deliver instruction in this model, but knowing that it's not going to be this way forever. Yeah. Sophia, this is, you know, I, I think I mentioned in our pre-call, Sophia, that I like to have these sort of have the feel of a great dinner party conversation. So this is a little bit out of left field, just like it might come in a dinner party conversation. But, uh, you know, um, the role of community, Denise just said, we're all going to have to kind of lean in and work on, on this together. The role of community seems so important in uh, public education in general, and particularly right now. When, and, and yet people are really insecure. There's a lot of stuff going on. I'm sure the superintendent gets all kinds of uh, things in her inbox. I get a lot of opinions. Yeah, yeah, a lot of opinions. Uh, Sophia, what are your observations on how community can come together across economic and uh, demographic uh, divides? How do we come together to support public schools, particularly in a time when the national election is, is dividing us and other things are not necessarily working in communities' favor. What are your thoughts there? Trying to make me solve everything in one question, DJ. Um, <laughs> Tough one, I know. No, I mean, listen, I think that across, you know, history and place, when groups of people have a common goal that they're all really um, invested in, passionate about, and have some some stake in it, there's, there's folks who work together all the time to make change happen, right? And to rally community. Um, and I think there is a shared common goal often in education, although you hear lots of different um, takes on it of supporting students and specifically supporting black and brown students, supporting all students um, in ways that um, honor their unique self and that provide them with um, every opportunity possible, right? Like I think that we can all say that that's what we're, where we want. Um, I think the, the nuance there for me is that sometimes when we say, let's come together across lines of difference to support communities, what that ends up really defaulting to is supporting folks who already have a lot of privilege or supporting, you know, and in this city, it's really supporting a lot of white communities, a lot of white families, right? And when we think about um, just the difference in resources even that communities have throughout the pandemic, right? Like, can you pay for a private tutor to come to your home and replace the education that you're getting? Do you have access to other online curriculums that might be really high quality um, that other folks don't have access to? Um, can your parent afford to stay home and, and support you as you're sitting there walking through all the curriculum content, right? There's this virtual space in the pandemic is only exacerbating the, the gaps and the inequities that were already present in our systems in ways that are only leaving our black and brown students further and further behind, right? So. I do think we need to rally as a community and support. And I think we need to be specific in the support that we are we are really trying to offer, right? So we're talking about, you know, uh, specifically in Seattle, like uh, I know that black male achievement is something that the district is really focused on. And that's from looking and seeing which group needs the most support and then how are we resourcing and offering that, right? Uh, City Year works in the 10 schools that it works in in South Seattle because um, we, we believe that students in South Seattle are brilliant and that the communities are brilliant and they know what are best for them and we're just there to provide additional support and whatever it is that means for, for students in the community, right? Um, and I think oftentimes we, we name what this, what success looks like and oftentimes it's really rooted in like a white dominant culture way of what success looks like and then we say everybody rally around that thing. But then it, does, it only works for a certain subset of folks. So how are we getting really intentional about listening to the community about what it is they need right now and then being specific about how we're resourcing and who we're resourcing? Yeah, and I would just add on, I mean, that's all right on. And, um, you know, just that the inequities that are really exposed right now have always been there. And, you know, systems, including Seattle Public Schools, has not always 
done well by black and brown students in our system? And again, how do we um, make a difference moving forward as we start rolling back, right? And it's like, we're gonna have to live through this era of remote learning, but when we come back, like how are we going to fundamentally restructure so that we are undoing those legacies of racism? And I think in Seattle, people really have to feel like they have a stake in that. And I found, I guess I've been here, I'm starting my third year is a lot of times, you know, we will talk about the discrepancies in our education system and we can make a strategic plan and we can put words on paper and we could put action plans behind them and we can really try to push the needle. And as a system, we can start having conversations within our system, like Sophia was talking about the racial equity teams, right? We do a lot of racial equity work at Seattle Public Schools, but it seems like the larger community hasn't quite caught on yet. Um, even, and, and I think this is the time, right? It's the time when Black Lives Matter is happening. We are all super aware of, of the systems and how they have to be undone um, and rebuilt in a different way that supports black and brown students that we've always marginalized and that history has shown that we often push out. And so how are we going to approach these challenges in a different way? But I also think Seattle, everybody in Seattle needs to see themselves in that and they have to have a stake in it. And before the pandemic, like we were pushing, um, sort of undoing some of the like, uh, discrepancies in our populations, even in a highly capable program, right? It's sort of like, it is very much a white gifted program in our system that, um, and, and that fight was really difficult. We weren't able to complete it. And I think it's because people don't see themselves as having a stake in making sure that we are uh, making sure that the students of color for this from educational justice actually have a good experience in our system. That when it comes down to it, you know, there's a closing in of like, well, I got mine. And so I need to keep it that way. And so those are the systems I think in public education is ripe for that of, of approaching it in a different way. Leslie, let me ask you about why you've come back for year two to be a volunteer second year. What is it about this, this mission, particularly the focus being focused on equity in schools? Why come back for a second year when, uh, this is a really hard time to be in education. Tell us about your experience. Yeah, it, it is a really hard time. Um, but I have, I really believe in the work that this organization does. And I'm really lucky to be able to continue to go back to a community that is familiar, that I do have relationships and connections. Um, and a couple, a couple days ago, or a couple weeks ago, I was on a national call, um, and I was able to connect with court with um, people who are also returning to City Year. And somebody mentioned um, we wear red jackets, not red capes. And I think in the work that we do, it's easy to fall into the mindset that we're we're here to save the students that we work with. And like, no, it's it's not. We are here to support them. Like they are very capable of achieving anything that they set their mind to. Um, so it's just, it's just really, I, I'm really lucky to be in a position to help them achieve their goals. And I, I, I really found like a home away from home in, in Seattle. So um, I'm just really lucky to be able to continue to, to work with the community. And this, this question, I think, is a really important one. I'm going to ask Denise this question in a second also, but let me ask you first, Leslie, for particularly state policymakers or people throughout the city of Seattle that may not be in, engaged in our schools or maybe their kids are older or maybe they're in a school that's not terribly diverse, what would you like them to know about your school and uh, what it's like being in a, in a very diverse educational institution and, and what that, what they should know about that institution during this time of COVID. Yeah. Um, one thing that I really admire about uh, Concord, um, it is located in South Park and in the South Park community, there is really a sense of support um, there. Yeah. There's really a feel of like, I got you. 
um, before the school year ended, uh, we had a school meeting and um, a member of the PTA was able to come and share on what they were doing to support um, students and families. Um, and one thing that I really admired was that they shared that they were helping um, families financially because that can be a burden and a worry on top of everything else that the families have to worry about. Um, so, so, um, so I just, I just wanted to name that that it's it's really at the end of the day it's it's the people who come together to support each other, um, and. I know it's like very ideal, idealistic to, to think that love makes the world go around, but honestly, like love can, can, make, um, can make moves. Um, unfortunately, we live in a world where money makes the moves, but we, we have to like center ourselves on like the human aspect and just like be kind and like love one another. Yeah, good, well said. Denise, let me ask you the same question, but put slightly differently when legislators and state policymakers go back, they will be talking about money uh, to Leslie's point and the looming budget uh, deficit at the state level and public education continues to make up the largest portion of our budget. What would you suggest the policy conversation be focused on when the legislature reconvenes either in the special session or the regular session? Is it money? Is it something else? Where should their eyes be focused? Well. I mean, I, I like Leslie's answer. They should focus on love and like figuring out how we're going to get through all of this. But I do know that they will talk about money. I mean, that's going to be, they have a big hole in their budget. There's a lot of needs across the state that they're going to have to have uh, really hard conversations about uh, reallocation of resources or cuts. Um, and so I do believe the budget and the money is going to be the big question at the legislative session. You know, we just hope in public education to stay as whole as possible. What I do know that are the top two needs, the things that I get asked the minute that we mentioned that we are going to remote is childcare and internet. Um, and really, I, I do believe that there's a lot of conversation right now. We need to have internet like a public utility. It needs to just be present everywhere. And, you know, through this closure that we had and that emergency remote learning period, it became very, very clear that if, again, if we are not providing access to learning, we are shutting out so many students unless we get that filled. And that shouldn't fall just on schools to, to, do, to fill that gap. We've been rolling out hotspots. We have a great uh, partnership with Comcast that is helping, but we really need to get, get to a place where there is internet for all. And and that it should not be a struggle to try to get access so that you can actually engage in remote learning. But you know, we're, we're getting down to the nitty gritty of trying to define who and where that gap still exists and then try to support in best way, the best way we can as far as getting internet out there. But again, I just don't, I, that should not be a school thing. That is a community wide thing. That's a statewide thing. That's a national thing that just really needs to happen. Um, but again, when the legislature comes back, it is going to be about funding. And we know that they just got through the McCleary fix and all of those types of things. And so we'll be trying to hold the line as much as possible, but there will be a lot of moving pieces for sure. Yeah. Let me ask uh, this question, Denise, from Nicole Sorensen. She, tying in and segueing from your comments about um, childcare, she asks about young people K through one, first, second grade in particular, and how the school district might be thinking in a differentiated way about supporting those kids since uh, she says logging into computers and online platforms without support from an adult uh, just ain't easy. If you, we all had, many of us have had little people and it's hard when they're in junior high, much less when they're uh, five and six and seven. So how, do you, how are you thinking at the district about differentiating across uh, age demographics? Yeah, and so that was sort of like when we were planning for the hybrid model, that was one thing. We wanted our early learners to be in school as much as possible. And so although we were aiming to get everybody back in at least two times a week, our K-1, K-2 was going to be four times a week. And so if there comes a time that we can be back in person, that will be, I believe, our first priority of rolling back. We are going to also need to provide 
um, services for uh, students with individual education plans or special education students. Some of those IEPs are going to require some in-person instruction. And so we'll be looking at different ways of prioritizing uh, who get, who's coming back in which spaces. Um, so there's just gonna be a lot of movement around that. And we also know that uh, you know, per our strategic plan that uh, as we start prioritizing groups of students, when the um, infection rate starts going down, we will be focusing on students of color for the educational justice as required through our strategic plan, Seattle Excellence. Um, we have as part of our strategic plan, um, our highest priority goal is third grade reading. And so there's going to have, to, we'll still keep that focus. We will still do a lot of work one thing we've done is that we are not providing laptops. We are providing um, iPads to our youngest learners just because it's an easier device that they can manipulate. Um, and then also trying to build in some supports for family tech services. So we'll, in that first week of coming back, we hope to um, have conversations with every family and every student around any tech support that might be necessary. And that will also include how to get um, learning supports um, in place as well. And we will be relying a lot on our community-based organizations and our partners who are in schools to um, help us problem solve around how are we providing supports for students in all the spaces where learning is happening. Yeah, very good. Sophia, let me ask, I just posed this question to, to Denise about uh, supporting kids in different age cohorts. But as you think about how we can best support teachers and faculty, what advice would you give to teachers about how to be sensitive to demographic diversity and how kids in, in some particular geographies, uh, particularly people who are black and brown, uh, may come from a situation or in a household that's not as conducive to education? How, are you, how would you counsel teachers to be thoughtful and supportive of kids who are of color or have uh, black and brown skin um, in a way that they may not always have been thinking about. I mean, these teachers are probably pretty savvy to it in the in classroom space, but now that we're in distance learning, how would you counsel them? Yeah, um, I'll start by just like one language piece, right? It's not that our, our black and brown students have um, household environments that aren't conducive to education. I wanna put that on the table for, first and foremost, I think what you're talking about maybe is more of the intersection of systems and how that impacts our families in disproportionate ways and therefore sort of the ways in which our students have to um, fill that, have to fill that gap themselves or families have to fill that gap themselves. So I just want to, I want to name that. Um, you know, I've, I've gotten to know so many amazing teachers. I have a lot of amazing teachers who are friends um, just through my time working in schools and with city year. And for, for, I would say for teachers who work um, in our schools and in our communities already, they are, generally speaking, highly emotionally intelligent. They have an understanding of, of equity and what their students might need. They are very human-centered, back to a term Leslie used, right, in the ways in which they approach students. They are, um, and those things, while the behavior is not gonna be the same because it's remote, those things do translate in some ways to the ways in which you support your students. Um, and so I think another thing that, you know, I've seen be really successful is there are a lot of teachers um, in the South End in Seattle public schools in general who form their own communities of support around this, right? Who are, they are constantly sharing ideas. They are constantly talking to one another. Um, they're building this really like adaptive community around each other to, to make sure that they are doing whatever they can for their students, right? Um, and I think this is a time to not wait to get things perfect, right? Like perfectionism is not going to work in our current environment. So what are the ways in which you can be creative and try something and see how it goes and get your students feedback, um, ask your students what it is that they need or what would be really helpful for them. You know, I think the thing that City Year does really, really well um, is they provide that additional support and additional person who can be um, just in, well, teachers are focusing on academics, checking on a student, how are you today, right? In a way that's more one-on-one, -on -one, that's more individual. Um, and so I think teachers leveraging other adults, teachers leveraging AmeriCorps members. Um, but yeah, I think our, our, our teachers in the South End, I, I have a lot of love for them. Um, and I think overwhelmingly, they their practice is not rooted in one specific place. It's rooted in their hearts and minds and the ways they approach students. And I think 
they're actively right now thinking about how that translates and sharing those ideas with each other. Yeah, good stuff. Denise Carolyn Logue asks if the school district has reached out for assistance from existing state approved online schools to help teachers navigate these challenges and try to learn from those schools that have focused in the online space. Any, any outreach or maybe lessons learned from some of those schools? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure like uh, what, I mean, we have a team that's working on that and I'm sure that they've looked around the country at best practices where uh, almost finished with a playbook, we're calling it a back to school playbook that will sort of line out all the best practices that have been gathered from across the country um, and, and how we're going to implement um, this remote learning. So what are we gonna do around curriculum, right? If we need a six through eight English language arts curriculum, what is that curriculum that we should be using in the, this interim? It, um, so common curriculums, common platforms, common communications, common schedules, um, and just trying to build again that predictability of uh, the educational experience for our students. And so there's been lessons, not just across the country, but globally, we've been watching how other countries are um, coming back into school and some of the lessons that are being learned there. And so we are constantly, I mean, I'm on calls with national superintendents all the time and regional superintendents and really just trying to problem solve all these issues. And so we've looked at a lot of resources. We've looked at a lot of research and, um, you know, we'll soon, I think next week are kind of rolling out the playbook and what those best practices are going to be for Seattle public schools. And that will include everything about coming back to school. What's athletics, what's remote learning look like, what are the common curriculums, um, What's the training that we're going to use for teachers? Um, and so all of that stuff will be included in that playbook. Yeah. Let me ask you this question, Denise. And I say this as a, uh, a white man who has benefited from a lot of privilege that I didn't even know existed, uh, frankly, because I just didn't have a lot of diversity growing up and, um, in my life. And so I was a beneficiary of a system that um, was propelling me in ways I didn't even know and appreciate, but clearly helped me. I've learned through hosting some of these conversations in the last few months in this time of George Floyd and others that um, some people think, and I'm wondering if you think this way, that there's no connection to uh, outcomes and race anywhere, that diversity and race is, has no impact on outcomes at, in the economic or educational level, but that the problem is racism and that racism causes different problems and, and, and differentiated outcomes and that when we at least uh, these folks have posited that I listened to uh, that if white people think that race is the problem, they can avoid it and take no responsibility. But if the problem is racism, then we all have a responsibility to try to do something. What do you make of that tenant? Yes, sir. Oh, hello. I, uh, sorry, everybody was frozen for a minute. So I, I kind of missed what the question was. So. It was a perfect time. It was such a, it was a question <laughs> that- uh, I'm sure uh, it was super profound. Well, not very profound, but um, let me sort of get to the punchline, which was uh, some people argue that race, is, there's no problem with race in America, particularly in education or in the economy, that the problem is with racism and that racism causes uh, differentiated outcomes and uh, uh, structural issues and toxic stress. And that when we talk about race, white people don't have to take ownership because they can't do anything about race. But when we talk about racism, that it's everybody's responsibility to try to do something. What do you make of that sort of premise? And um, because you've done a lot on, on race in your short time at the head of Seattle Public Schools. Yeah, I mean, I think it's all of that. I think we are all, racist in a way because of the racist structures that we've been engaged in. And, um, you know, I think it is part of our goal to make sure that we are undoing all of our biases, right? That we all grow up with that. We, you know, I just think of growing up in Montana and the work that I did there with American Indian education, right? And just like the curriculum that gets used and what we don't learn about black and brown people in schools um, lends to a worldview that really does favor white privilege. I mean, because we're not learning about all those things. And so 
it is both about race uh, in particular because we don't learn an accurate and truthful history of this country or really about the contemporary lives of black and brown people and how they um, make meaningful contributions um, to what we're doing. And it's also the racism and the structural racism that we have across the board. It's not just in Seattle public schools, but I think you're seeing the outcries around um, the police departments and the justice system. I mean, it's just ever present and we are immersed in that constantly. And that is how we've learned to navigate the world. And so I think it's both of those. And in Seattle Public Schools, when we're thinking about it, we're all, we are unlearning what we've all learned and then trying to refill, re, refill our brains with a different way of being. And it goes back to what Leslie talked about. It's like, we have to love black boys in our system. We have to make sure that our educators um, see the brilliance and, and is not in a deficit model or, or view of, of how black and brown students um, navigate. You know, we have disproportionality and discipline that we really need to engage in. And why is that happening? So it's asking the right questions and then digging in and making sure that we are working with communities of color on the solutions. And so I think it's all of that. Leslie, if you had a room full, which you may have a room full in this virtual experience of, of people who are mostly white and, and very interested in supporting public education, but maybe don't have a very fine grained understanding of how race can, and racism can impact education, based on your experience, how would you try to educate people who, uh, who are well-intentioned and maybe have money and they want to write checks, but they, they don't really have the lived experience of a diverse uh, childhood or diverse education experience. How would you educate uh, white folks on this topic? That is a good question. Um, that is a big question. Um, I think just like sitting down and having these conversations um, and perhaps the individuals don't have the background and it's not, it's not up to the BIPOC black indigenous people of color to teach the white folks about like their experiences. It's, um, it's up to the individuals to do their own learning. Um, but yeah, just like having these conversations and being aware of the topics and being mindful of how the conversations are being told or being brought up. Um, I had another thought. Um, I just lost it. That's okay. That's a good answer. A good answer. <laughs> PJ, can I jump? Can I jump in? Please. Since we're dinner conversationing it. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think you know. Like for me, hearing that question, like my first reaction is that, especially following like the death of George Floyd and this like new heightened awareness for some people around the racial justices that are happening in this country, there's really no excuse for white folks not to be educating themselves, right? Like I can open up my browser or social media or a million different places and see lists of uh, resources for folks, whether that's books or articles or podcasts. Um, that are really aimed at white folks specifically educating themselves around race, right? So I think that's something that, um, much to Leslie's point, that really is not up to BIPOC folks to be the ones who are doing that. And so like looking to communities or to people to represent an idea, I think it's really on folks picking up that helm and, and doing it themselves. And then kind of back to the question for Superintendent Juno, I think like race and racism are linked, right? Like the one was created so that they could perpetuate the other, right? Um, and I think when I think about, you know, you, you posited as if it's not about race, then maybe white folks could just sit back and not do anything about it because it's not racism. You know, it just one thing I think about a lot in the education system is if you're a white family in Seattle and you don't send your student to your local public school, why is that? And what is, and what is that rooted in, right? Because I think that is one very specific example of you could go day to day in your everyday life and not say a racist thing 
And how are ways in which you're acting and choosing different behaviors perpetuating racist systems, right? So I think that's sort of the, the cross of where I see those, those things. Yeah, yeah, great And stuff. I think it was, I, I'll just jump in again. I think, you know, the, when I talked about like uh, our struggle of trying to unlock the challenges of highly capable, right? It is highly segregated. It is a segregated system and it's a segregated program um, with the vast majority of our of students in the highly capable are white and very few are black and brown. And so, you know, when you see a problem like that within a system, like a public education a school, um, that is something that we really need to interrogate. And why is it that way? And a lot of times it is because it comes with a certain privilege, it comes with the stature, it comes with, you know, I need my student to be in that specific program at that specific school. Um, and I think it goes exactly to what Sophia was talking about. It's like, we need to interrogate all of that and why we are all making the choices we're making within a system. Um, and so it, it's all interesting, but I do think it, that's the work of like, why asking the questions, why is it that way? Digging deep in that and being willing to sit in places that are really uncomfortable that, you know, you're hearing about um, stories of, you know, I sit in a, a lot of communities where, you know, because of history and because of the protests that are going on, there's just a lot of trauma that's being lived over and over again. And so how are we using this moment to really dig in and figure out how we're going to do things differently? And, you know, it is, it's a white people problem right now. And, and it's a white issue of having to do the work to make sure that you understand um, exactly I, not exactly, but better um, those experiences because you don't have that lived experience. And so I think that's really, um, that, that's the work that has to happen. Yeah, great, great stuff. Let me ask you as we get close to the end here, Denise, how does City Year contribute to addressing this problem? What, what do they provide that would be absent if they were not at the table? Well, no, City Year is awesome. I mean, we call on them for a lot. They I have a student advisory board and city year has stepped up and helps navigate that because, you know, they're young people. And, you know, as I said, on one of our meetings is, um, you know, they are the TikTok generation and I'm still on Facebook. So it's, you know, we need the presence of uh, young people who are so bright. Like when I visit schools and I even visit, like I visit a lot, I, I, vis I have visited all of our schools, but when I engage with young people in our system, high school kids, city year, young people, they, um, they're so smart and they are leading efforts right now. I mean, I've been to a couple of protests that were student led and they are very engaged. They know how they want the world to look. They know how they want the world to work. Um, and they are, really engaged with each other in making sure that happens. And so super smart. And I always leave those conversations. And, and this is like the work in education, right? Is sort of, I always leave the conversations, even though some of them are really hard about listening to the system that you're leading and how it's not working for them. Um, energized and optimistic about the future, because that next generation is really going to rock it. And I think that's really what city year brings to the table as well is the ability to um, have that perspective and to bring that mindset to our young people um, in our system is super powerful. So we have time just for one quick answer from each of you on this last question that I wanna pose. These are bright days in terms of sun, but frustrating and stressful days in terms of much of what's happening around us. Leslie, let me ask you first, what gives you hope right now as we sit at the end of July 2020, as you look into the school year ahead and the months to come, what gives you hope? Um, one thing that gives me hope is that I'm not the only one feeling this. On some days, um, it can get easy for me to get like lost in my head and feel very isolated and lonely. But then I find comfort in knowing that I'm not the only one feeling this. And 
what gives me hope is knowing that, you know, we're all working together and we're working hopefully for um, a, a better, a better future. Yeah, great. Sophia, what gives you hope today? Yeah, I'll name, I have a three and a half year old, Vivian, who is, was supposed to be going to Seattle preschool. Uh, starting Sorry. Well. I know, I know, it's not your fault. Um, and so, you know, I think she gives me hope. I think that when I think about young people, it has a face and a name for me and she is brilliant. And as hard as this time has been and, um, you know, having to be in isolation as a three and a half year old, I think still seeing her find joy in little things and explore the world and knowing that, you know, a lot of our education happens in the classroom and a lot of our education happens outside of the, the classroom. And both of those things are valuable and need to be valued in, in different ways. So I think she gives me hope that she is learning um, in the school of, of life right now. And that is OK. And that um, uh, sh she gives me hope for the future. I think the other thing is just um, when I pause to reflect on the ways in which like our, our black and brown communities have supported each other for centuries. Right. Like uh, have always like did uh, our communities in different ways. I think um, I have hope that white folks are um, stepping into that space in a different way than they have. And I'm hoping that um, there is a, a, a renewed interest in terms of uh, resources, in terms of what people are voting for and who they're voting for, and in terms of the actions that folks can take that um, are going to are gonna continue to, to make progress. Good. Good. Denise, in just a few yeah, it's a, it's the same. I'm I'm just happy people are fired up, right? They're fired up about race in this country. They're fired up about race in um, this city. And like I said at the beginning, we in Seattle we have a lot of great personalities and we have a lot of wealth. And we need to really take this opportunity of people being fired up and do something with it. And I really feel like we're in a time where if we don't, then it's a shame on us moment. And I really don't want Seattle to be in that moment. Um, and then the other thing is that our young people are fired up. And um, just again, visiting with them, it's just every time you sit down with young people and we should all do that more often, super inspirational. Um, it, they are really unbelievable. And that just, I mean, when I visit with our students and like I said, sometimes it's hard, but it makes me really proud to be the leader of this district. Um, and it's time to um, help them help us transform it. Great stuff. I'm reminded that the root uh, of courageous is, of course, core and meaning hearted, big hearted. And uh, uh, it takes big heartedness and authenticity to be courageous. And I appreciate the courage each of you are bringing to your work and to this conversation today. Those who are watching, I really appreciate your participation and hopefully this conversation on race and equity meets you where you are. Uh, and I would do your best to take Leslie's advice to try to ask and listen to, and have conversation. Denise, do you know Seattle super, excuse me, superintendent of Seattle Public Schools, Sophia Voss, the uh, direct national director of staff and learning practice at City Year and Leslie Hernandez, AmeriCorps member and team leader at Concord International Elementary School. Thank you to each of you for joining us and thank you for those watching at TVW at our site or online and live now. We will send you uh, an email to those who are participating to ask for your feedback and guidance. I'd love to get your, your input on how we could do this better for you in the future. Thanks for watching. Thank you for joining us and for supporting the independent public service journalism provided at WashingtonStateWire.com. Thank you.